In this episode, we talk about what pushes athletes to resort to doping and the kinds of concerns this raises. We also give you an update on Cyclone Mikjong. But first, we talk about a brutal killing in Rajasthan. Hi, I'm Rahil Filipos and you are listening to Three Things, the Indian Express News Show. On Tuesday, the president of the Shri Rashtriya Rajput Karni Sena, Sukhdev Singh Gogamidi, was shot dead at his residence in Jaipur by three gunmen. One of the gunmen was subsequently killed in retaliatory firing and two others who were present at Gogamidi's home were injured. Shortly after the incident, a gangster named Rohit Godara took responsibility for the killing in a Facebook post. The remaining two of the three assailants are still on the run. Meanwhile, supporters of Gogamidi launched protests in cities across the state, demanding immediate action against the accused. Kanye Sena activists demanded a statewide band on Wednesday. With protests breaking out in multiple cities, shops and businesses were shut down and many private schools remained closed as a precautionary measure. The Indian Express's Hamza Khan joins us in the segment to talk about Goga Medi, his death and the demands of his supporters. So Hamza, Goga Medi has been a pretty controversial figure in Rajasthan. Who exactly was he and what was his political career like? So he was indeed controversial and he had 20 to 30 cases. And he was a history sheeter in his hometown in Hanumangarh. So he had cases ranging from rape to murder against him. And uh, not much is known about uh, him until the mid-2000s when he became active socially. He started leading campaigns for his community, which is the Rajput community in Hanumangarh. And he organized campaigns and led them. And uh, he used to consider Marana Pratap as his idol and often quoted him as well. So over the years, he built his profile in Bhatara and uh, he leveraged that to get a ticket from the Bhajan Samaj Party in 2013. So he contested the 2013 polls on a BSP ticket. But he finished third behind the BJP and the CPM candidates. So, like all this time, like he came to be associated with the Sri Rajput Karni Sena as well. And uh, he has been active over the past several years, quite active. And in fact, during the recent elections, which we just had in Rajasthan, he was also seeking a Congress ticket from Bhadra Assembly seat, but uh, he was denied. Right. And you mentioned how he came to be associated with the Karni Sena, but he was eventually expelled from the Shri Rajput Karni Sena, right? Which was when he founded his own faction, the Shri Rashtriya Rajput Karni Sena. Can you talk about his faction and his prominence within the Rajput activist community? So currently there are three factions of the Rajput Karni Sena, all of which originated from the 2006 Karni Sena, which was formed by Ajit Singh Mamdoli and Lokendra Singh Kalvi. So two are named Shri Rajput Karni Sena and there is one Shri Rashtri Rajput Karni Sena which was led by Gogamedi. So despite the infamy and the cases, Gogamedi continued to remain important due to the relevance of caste outfits in the scheme of things and his prominence and that of his organization can be gauged from the fact that countless messages came in from across the political spectrum from state to national leaders. Right now, Hamza, he was killed this week by three gunmen at his own home in broad daylight. Um, What exactly happened there? So he was at his residence yesterday, Sukhdev Singh Gogamedi. And there is one person, Naveen Singh Shekhawad, who is also seen in the video. So through him, two persons had approached Gogamedi, who are Rohit Rathod and Nitin Fauji. So yesterday, what happened, one of the accused uh, took out his uh, gun and, you know, started shooting at Gogamedi and the other one joined as well. So Naveen Singh Shekhawat, he is the one who's sitting on the left of Gogamedi. So he also gets up and he tries to stop one of the shooters and then they also shoot him and then they head out. And then one of the guards of Gogamedi, he also shoots at one of the shooters. So they shoot back and there is a lot of exchange of fire. 
So in the exchange, Gogamedi is killed, Naveen is killed, and uh, one Ajit Singh, who was known to Sukhdev Singh Gogamedi, he was also injured, and Gogamedi's gunman Narendra Singh was also injured. And then there was one local as well. Hemraj. So after shooting Guga Medi, these two shooters see Hemraj coming on his scooty. So they wave uh, their gun at him and uh, they also hurt him. It's not clear whether they shot at him or physically hurt him. So they snatch his scooty and then they escape. Right. And what has the police investigation found so far? Have they been able to identify a motive? So the police is still investigating right now. They have zeroed in on the two two accused whom I have just named. So, but then there is this gangster Rohit Godhara who took responsibility for the murder in a Facebook post. So, police is still verifying the claim, but uh, it's somehow more or less fits along the narrative that there was a threat from Lawrence Pishnoi gang, which Punjab police had communicated to Rajasthan earlier this year, and Gogamedi had been seeking security, but then he was not given security. So, Rohit Godhara is said to be from the Lawrence. Bishnoi gang, but Rohit Godara, who's also known as Ravtaram, he's originally from Bikaner and he's also a history sheeter in Kalu Police Station in Bikaner. But he's not in India, he's abroad somewhere. So in the Facebook post, he says that uh, Gogamedi was actively helping people who were working against Godara. So that's like as per the Facebook post, if that is a genuine Facebook post indeed. So that's the main reason behind this uh, murder that Gogamedi was helping people who were against Rohit Godara. And after his death, uh, Hamza, hundreds of his supporters launched protests across the city. They also called for a statewide band. So what's the situation in Rajasthan and what were their demands? So there are, like I said, multiple Rajput, Karnisena factions. So all of them have formed a united front and uh, they're leading it together. And uh, I mean, of course, there are lots of uh, Rajput community has a say in about like has the most number of voters in about 25 assembly seats in Rajasthan out of 200, which is one eighth of the total number of assembly seats. So they have mainly a demands. They are first is that they're demanding arrest of Rohit Kudara and the people, the two who carried out the murder. Second, they have demanded that a committee headed by a high court judge should be set up to investigate the reasons for not giving security to Gogamedi and that the concerned officials should be sacked because even uh, Gogamedi himself had said publicly that he's receiving death threats. He had met police officials. He had said that no, his life is in danger. But then it's still not clear why police didn't give him security. One of the reasons could be that he himself was a history sheeter with 22, 30 cases against him. So outgoing leader of opposition, Rajendra Rathor, who is also a big name in Rajasthan politics and who also hails from the Rajput community, has said that he will write to the union government requesting that the case be handed over to the NIA. And that is also the third demand of the protest demanding that this case be handed over to the NIA. The fourth demand is that the case should be fast-tracked and the murderers should be hanged and their homes should be bulldozed. And the fifth demand is that the concerned SHO, under whose jurisdiction the like Gogamedi's home came, should be sacked, as well as the concerned uh, police officials in the police station and the uh, zonal SP and other policemen. The sixth demand is that the government should give government jobs as well as rupees 11 crore to Gogamedi's family. The seventh demand is that a high level lifetime security be granted to Gogamedi's family, which should be borne by the government and that, that his family members should also be immediately issued an arms license. And the eighth demand is that all the witnesses should be given protection. His body is still at the hospital where he was taken yesterday after the shootout. And uh, the protesters are sitting outside the hospital and they're saying that the Dharna and protests with the dead body will continue until all the demands are met. Right. And this comes at a pretty tense time in the state, right? The BJP won the recently held assembly polls, which means that they will be replacing the Congress government shortly. So how did both these parties react to the news? The BJP and the Congress have been trading allegations over this case because we have a peculiar period in Rajasthan where Chief Minister, like outgoing Chief Minister Ashok Gehloth, has already submitted his resignation to Governor Kalraj Mishra and the BJP is yet to decide who the CM is. So there is no Home Minister, there is no Chief Minister, the ministers or the MLAs are yet to take oath. And so Congress says that it is the responsibility of BJP since uh, Congress is no more in power. So it's the responsibility of BJP which should, uh, you know, address the situation and uh, people are already emboldened under knowing that BJP government is coming. The criminals and the, you know, gangsters are already emboldened uh, knowing that BJP has come back to power. 
So BJP, on the other hand, says that it is a side of maybe uh, a fallout of the poor law and order situation which the state witnessed over the last five years. So that's why we are still seeing, you know, such a crime happening, a broad daylight matter happening because of the poor law and order situation under uh, Chief Minister Ashok Gehlot. So they have been trading barbs over this case and neither of them is really taking responsibility. And so in that situation, we had Governor Kalraj Mishra, who has been taking stock of the situation and uh, taking updates from uh, Chief Secretary Usha Sharma and DGP Mesh Mishra. And he also, in fact, both these Usha Sharma and uh, Chief Secretary Usha Sharma and DGP Mesh Mishra and uh, some other officials reached the Raj Bhavan and briefed the governor on the situation. Uh, governor has also appealed to the people of Rajasthan to maintain peace. And next, we speak about the kind of concerns that doping raises for Indian athletics. Back in September, the Indian Express had reported on a fiasco that occurred on the final day of the Delhi State Athletics Championship. More than half of the athletes who were participating in the championship bolted when officials from the National Anti-Doping Agency, or NADA, turned up during the finals. Here, the Indian Express's Andrew Amsan, who wrote about the events of the day, reminds us what had happened. So, at the Delhi State Athletics Championship in September, first day of the event, there was this video which was widely circulated of uh, the syringes which were found um, in the sinks of the washroom at the Jawahar Lal Nehru Stadium in Delhi. So, that video kind of really uh, became viral and reached the top officials. So, usually in state level meets, the National Anti-Doping Agency skip testing or they usually don't come but because of this uh, viral video there was a lot of pressure so they actually turned up so even the athletes were unaware so they turn up on the second day and as soon as they turn up participation in the finals you know just like goes down significantly in fact in some events like the 100 meters men's just one participant turned up for the finals so there's this funny incident where a steeple chaser didn't even stop after finishing the race because uh, she saw the dope testers at the finish line so she kept on running so she was apparently chased by them i don't know if they eventually caught her or not so these kinds of things happen so Indian Express had uh, done a story on the whole uh, incident in September and it was widely read and followed up by a lot of organizations. So uh, the news eventually reached uh, the higher ups in the World Athletics, which is the apex athletics body and also the World Anti-Doping Agency. So the World Anti-Doping Agency has actually asked India's Federation, the Athletics Federation for a report on the incident. The Athletics Federation says uh, another inquiry process is still on. So it's a major development in the sense that a Delhi state meet, a state level meet uh, has caught the attention of uh, world bodies like WADA and um, World Athletics. Now, the paper recently found out that the lone athlete who participated in the men's 100 meters final had also failed his dope test. And this has once again raised concerns about the prevalence of doping in Indian athletics, especially in the junior level. And to discuss these concerns, we speak to Andrew in this segment. So, Andrew, it's recently come to light that the lone athlete who competed during the final, he also failed his dope test. Could you tell us what had happened? So, there was this one athlete who had competed in the 100 meters final. There were supposed to be nine finalists, so only one turned up. So, this athlete uh, was tested by anti-doping officials at the same venue on 26th of uh, September and a month later he was intimated by the officials that he has failed a dope test. This was in October but the report came to light in the sense uh, reached the media recently just a day back so it's worrying that eight athletes didn't turn up and the only athlete who actually turned up also has tested positive for dope. And do we know about the kind of drug he tested positive for? So it's called drostinolon. So this is a commonly used drug by weightlifters. It's an anabolic steroid. So it boosts your uh, strength and reduces your body fat. So there isn't a specific sports drug made. So all these drugs, all these uh, dopes are derived from normal medication. So this medication is used to reduce cholesterol in the body. And in some cases, it is also used for cancer treatment, especially in breast cancer treatment. So the access to these drugs are so easy. Most of these drugs are just available over the counter at a medical shop. Right. And what did the athlete claim about the findings? Because he did compete despite the presence of NADA officials. 
I spoke to him yesterday. Uh, the first thing he mentioned was, had I taken any performance enhancing drug, I wouldn't have run the finals. And he claims that he has been framed by coaches. So there are two samples, sample A and B. Sample A has been tested positive. So he can ask for sample B to be tested in case there is a technical error or some other sort of uh, an issue. But he is not going to contest and he is not going to appeal because he said he doesn't have any proof. So I, I will uh, quote an, a recent incident where this athlete called Shivpal Singh is a javelin thrower. He failed a dope test and was handed a four-year ban. But he appealed, he contested the findings and he said the supplement he was taking was contaminated and he wasn't aware. So he had a sample of the supplement, in fact, a box of the supplement and on the supplement, the ingredients were mentioned. So he had to submit that for testing and they found that the supplement had certain drugs that weren't allowed. So in that case, his ban from four years was reduced to just one year. So he's already competing now. So in this case, the athlete in question at the Delhi State Meet is likely to face a four-year ban. And the irony is that the other eight who didn't turn up are still eligible to compete because against their name, you'll just find did not participate or did not DNS, did not start. So, Andrew, doping has become a major issue in Indian athletics, uh, particularly at the junior level. Can you tell us what leads athletes to resort to doping? One would wonder, like, what does actually a state level medal do? Or actually, does it really help in terms of monetary benefits or other benefits like jobs? So, the answer is a Delhi state meet alone wouldn't guarantee you enough, any of these incentives. But this is the first step. To reach to the national level, your state level competition performances are analyzed. This is probably the first level. You have to crack this level to reach the next level. Since we're talking about the Delhi state meet, Delhi, as we'll talk about, there are two major programs run by the Delhi government, which is called Mission Excellence and Play and Progress. So, you know, an athlete who reaches the finals and finishes in the top eight is eligible for a scholarship of 16 lakh per annum. Also, a Delhi state certificate helps you get points for admission at the Delhi University. So right now, the admission process is a bit different with common tests and common entrance exams. Earlier, there was a 50-50 ratio, like a 50% weightage of your admission points were just ports. So these, every little certificate, every little performance matters in that case. And another interesting point I'd like to mention. So, So again, we are assuming that The other athletes, they were doping. So other athletes who didn't turn up for the finals, one of the reasons could be because the circular, which talks about the circular of mission excellence and play and progress mentions that if an athlete is caught doping or fudging age or age violation, A, their scholarship will be cancelled. And also the money which has already been given to them can be recovered. So this could be one of the reasons why the athletes didn't run. So I can confirm that there were at least one athlete in the list who withdrew and um, his name is in one of these schemes and he has received uh, money before. Right. And apart from the penalties that you mentioned, are there any other repercussions faced by athletes, you know, especially in the national level? So the punishment or the ban period does not depend on the level of competition. It's the same if you fail at a state level meet or a national level meet. It's the same. For National Anti-Doping Agency, I think, hands over a four-year ban for first violation. Again, if you accept that you had doped, one year is reduced. So four years for the first instance. And for the second instance, it's a life ban. So even four years for an athlete is almost like ending the athlete's career because athletes have a very short span right again a doping violation against your name eventually would affect your uh, chances of getting a job in fact till last year you couldn't apply for a sports award like uh, Kail Ratna or any sports award if you had a doping violation against your name. But now the sports ministry has tweaked their rules. An athlete becomes eligible if they have served the doping ban, so as in they've served the doping period. So the larger repercussion is obviously a your reputation is at stake once you are named in your in a doping list. Your subsequent performances are always looked down. They're always scrutinized. Oh, second, eventually it 
definitely affects your uh, probability of getting hired in sports quota jobs so these are the major um, repercussions i would say as if you are caught doping and could you talk about how this impacts athletes who don't resort to doping so the biggest drawback or biggest problem with this doping issue is honest athletes athletes who train very hard who don't take these shortcuts they are affected let's say a young athlete starts training at the age of 13 and first of all the athlete is competing against people who have doping also there is another problem of age fudging so a 13 year old is literally participating against a 16 year old who has also taken dope first year no result comes second year no result comes third year no result comes because the athlete is just perennially you know competing against athletes who are older and who are doping the athlete might have a lot of talent but eventually the athlete will get disappointed and quit the sport and i have spoken to a lot of such athletes who say we probably just going to quit next year we can't compete because it's unfair on these honest athletes because a lot of hard work goes in and we are talking about professional uh, athletes at least 4 years of hard work goes in but these athletes want shortcuts they for jobs and others these incentives so the issue is really serious because they are not only jeopardizing their careers by taking such methods but also affecting honest athletes right and and what kind of concerns does this raise when it comes to athletics itself so this is not good for the sport now parents reading articles like this seeing the state of junior level athletics they wouldn't be encouraged to send their children to compete i've spoken to a lot of such parents again in a way it is good that the nad officials are testing athletes more frequently now and the news is coming out so it is a time to introspect uh, officials and authorities should really take into account what has happened recently so this whole incident has definitely brought in a lot of attention in the negative sense on indian athletics at a time where athletics is actually doing well so the problem with these junior level uh, doping is that these athletes win medals at the junior level and you know even let's say on the national level but at the international level where doping testing is very stringent eventually win nothing so this has been the story of indian athletics for a long time that our athletes compete and perform so well in india but the moment they graduate to the senior level they don't do well because you can't compete against world class athletes if you are doping doping is going to only take you to a certain level maybe get you a job but eventually to become a proper professional athlete you have to follow the right method right process so this is the long term effect of like junior level doping that long term effect of junior level doping is that india doesn't perform well at the big stage at international events so the right thing would be to do is to eliminate or curb doping at the junior level bring in harsher punishments for such athletes because honest serious athletes deserve a better platform to compete and in the end we give you an update on cyclone mikjong The death toll from Chennai's widespread deluge caused by Cyclone Mikjong has gone up to 17. While the hours-long heavy rain in the city stopped on Monday night, streets remained waterlogged. The 17 deaths that took place in Chennai since Monday were mostly due to drowning, electrocution, collapsing walls and falling trees. Several others were injured. Tamil Nadu authorities had moved 32,158 people to relief camps over 2 days. Currently 411 relief centers are operational in the state and as many as 3 lakh packets of food have been distributed in 3 districts of Tamil Nadu. Now the fishing community has been particularly affected with 1200 fishing boats completely damaged and numerous others partially damaged or missing. Chennai core areas including Besan Nagar, Arumbakkam and Thondiarpet witnessed hip deep water disrupting normal life and complicating rescue efforts and for rescue measures the greater chennai corporation has deployed 21000 staff supplemented by 5000 personnel from other districts the rain also led to cancellation of around 300 flights with the chennai airport shutting down its airfield the southern railway also cancelled several long distance trains to help the state agencies the army and the national disaster response force have also joined the rescue efforts meanwhile coastal andhra pradesh saw massive downpour on tuesday after cyclone mikjong made landfall in the state between nellore and kavali authorities in the state had moved around 9500 people from vulnerable areas into 211 relief camps across affected districts 
till now no casualties were reported in andhra pradesh According to the India Meteorological Department the landfall process of cyclone Mikjong is now completed and the weather system is likely to move northwards and weaken into a cyclonic storm This was the first cyclone system to cross the coast in 2 years after cyclone Gulab in September 2021 You were listening to 3 things by the Indian Express Today's show was edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar It was written and produced by me Rahil Philippos and Ucha Sarmin who originally spoke to Andrew for the second segment. If you like the show then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also recommend the show to someone who you think will like it. Share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can also tweet us at express podcasts and write to us at podcast@indianexpress.com. At